Jeez. <laughs> um, welcome back to the afternoon session of the Public Accountability Committee's hearing uh, oversighting the COVID-19, the government's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, we're particularly focusing on the arts and creative industries today. Our next four witnesses um, all come from, um, um, all, all, all have deep experience in operators. We have Mr Sam Nardo, the Chief Operating Officer of Century Venues, which includes the Enmore Theatre, Factory Theatre, Metro Theatre, and Max Watts at Moore Park. Mr Mark Gerber, the CEO and founder and licensee of the Oxford Arts Factory. Um, Ms Carolyn Buckingham, who is joining us in person. Welcome, Carolyn. Um, the owner of the Butcher's Brew Bar. And Ms Tyler Dombrowski, the General Manager and Director of Crowbar Sydney. I might ask you each, if you would, to take an oath and an affirmation. Um, uh, we might start with uh, oath or affirmation, and then I'll ask uh, each of you if you wish to give a, a brief opening statement. We might start with you, Mark, uh, either an oath or an affirmation, if you'd please. Yes, that's... Um, I, Mark Gerber, solemnly and sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Thanks, Mark. Um, Tyler? I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. Sam? I solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And Caroline? I, Caroline Buckingham, solemnly, sincerely and truly declare and affirm that the evidence now about to be given by me shall be the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And I might invite you now each, if you wish, to give a brief opening statement and we'll adopt the same order if that's OK. Mark. Thank you. As stated, my name is Mark Gerber. I am the CEO, founder and licensee for the Oxford Art Factory. We are a dedicated and purpose-built small to medium light music and performance venues situated in the basement of 38 to 46 Oxford Street, Darlinghurst. Over 13 years of operation, we've seen upwards of 20,000 live music performances take place to an estimated audience of more than 1 million people showcasing acts from across Australia and the globe. Oxford Art Factory is an essential part of Sydney's cultural fabric and nighttime economy and a hugely important venue in any artist's career. The effects of COVID-19 are felt by all businesses, none more so than the independent live music venues such as ours, as we rely solely on live performance for our income stream. The collective of live music venues who are before you today plays a significant role in the music industry of New South Wales and Australia, a multi-billion dollar drive with far-reaching economic, social, economic and social benefits for people of this state and Australia as a nation. Live music is an industry run by passionate people, people like us. We provide and give back more than we make and always place the interests of others above our own. We want to assist the New South Wales government in making the pandemic recovery work as it should for the people of Sydney and this state. Still, we cannot get there alone. Our hands are currently tied in such ways that we're facing insurmountable hurdles in the coming months if COVID-19 restrictions continue to curtail our working business models. We congratulate the New South Wales government on its recently announced 24-hour economy strategy, strategy for Sydney your recognition of the cultural values it brings to people and the global cities like Sydney is now firmly ready for action. We ask you to help us in this time of crisis for our industry. We want to continue to play the much needed roles that will be asked of us when life wants to return to some semblance of normality for the people of New South Wales and the envisaged 24 hour economy. Please help us help you help all of New South Wales. Thanks, Mark. Tyler? You've still got it on mute, sorry. You've come off now, yep. Oh, sorry. Um, my name is Tyler Nabrowski. I'm a director and the general manager of Crowbar Sydney. We opened in late 2018 with our flagship band in Brisbane opening in 2012. We host an average of 700 bands in each city each year, over 7,000 bands across both venues in the last eight years. Curate events ourselves and a long-standing network of artists, promoters, booking agents. 
supporting Australian live music is at the core of Crowbar, providing a platform for emerging local and national acts and showcasing growing Australian and international talent. Prior to COVID-19, we were hosting three to six live music events each week, contributing over half a million dollars a year in staff wages, subcontractors and security working our events, and a further $800,000 generated in ticket sales going direct to artists. <clears throat> in March, we lost 40 shows over a three month period in a matter of days, with the remainder of our 2020 calendar clearing. Soon, uh, through March and April, we were trading at zero to 3%. Thankfully, with live music slowly returning in August, we've managed to increase to between 10 and 20%. We understand and respect the restrictions in place, and we are doing our part to contribute to safe events and a safe environment, but our industry is going to take a long time to return to a glimmer of normality, <clears throat> excuse me, and we need assistance to recover from the closures to provide this recovery period. We see the recent increase for stadiums to 50% capacity with less than 1.5 metre spacing between seats <clears throat> and have to wonder why with such smaller capacities and easier to manage crowds, we can't also be considered with a reduction of these regulations. JobKeeper and the Small Business Grants have been a welcome help for our venue and many others. Without these initiatives, we wouldn't have been able to reopen. The federal grants available, like Live Music Australia, may help us to put on events, uh, but at reduced capacities, we are limited to what revenue these create. They don't help us recover months of lost income, pay our operating costs, rent debt, or repay loans we've had to take to survive closures and kickstart JobKeeper. Live music venues are a vital element to the ecosystem of the music industry, providing a space for artists to connect with their fans, providing thousands of jobs and contributing millions to the New South Wales economy each year. Australia and New South Wales in particular is at great risk of losing hundreds of live music venues. We need our government to do more and with other state governments to help save our stages so that we can be here at the end to support the industry that supports so many others in times of crisis. Uh, thanks very much, Tyler. Uh, look, I'd, I'd urge everybody, if they could, to put their um, um, devices on mute um, when you're not speaking. The secretary can assist some of the web, um, anyone on, on WebEx, but Mark, we can't, we, we, we can't on the phone, I don't think. So if we could um, have people mute when they're not speaking, that would be very helpful. Sam. Thank you, and thank you to the committee for hearing from us today. My name is Sam Nardo. I'm the Chief Operating Officer at Century. We run a group of live, dedicated music and performance venues that include the Enmore, Metro and Factory Theatres. Still operating as a family business that began in 1984, reviving the Enmore, we have reinvested in smaller venues and now host thousands of events per year for more than one million audience members. However, currently these venues are in crisis. Our revenues are fully reliant on live music and performance. Unlike pubs and clubs, we're not able to open to generate revenue through gaming, bistros and bottle shops. These live music venues are long established touring circuit rooms that can only operate with borders open. The Enmore and Metro Theatres, for example, rely on 50% of its shows from international touring and a further 30% from interstate artists. As a direct result of the public health order in March, these venues lost 100% of their revenue. And with the current square metre restrictions in place, it means they're either unable to reopen or at such a limited capacity, they are running at a loss. As a group of dedicated live music venue operators from all around the state, we stand collectively to state the need for a lifeline similar to that provided in Victoria, extended to their live music purpose-built venues. We commend the direction that, that points to our cultural businesses assisting in the recovery of the economy in Sydney recently announced. A 2017 UTS study on the economic impact of the Enmore certainly supports this, finding that the theatre alone generated more than $39 million worth of additional elective spending in 2016. Unlike many other important cultural institutions like the Sydney Opera House, and City Recital Hall, these independent venue businesses meet the cultural imperatives important to our state without any form of funding, and as such, go under the radar. However, without financial assistance now, 
restrictions remaining in place, borders shut, JobKeeper dropping, and the significant overhead that our businesses need to pay, these venues will be forced to let staff go and ultimately fold as we continue to accumulate debt. There is a great opportunity now for the New South Wales Government to save these venues to generate not only economic benefit, but provide a considerable cultural value as well. Thank you. Thanks, Sam. Caroline? <clears throat> Uh, my name is Caroline Buckingham. I'm the licensee and owner of Butcher's Brew Bar, a small bar and live music venue in Dulwich Hill in West Sydney. Butcher's Brew presents high caliber live music across multiple genres, including jazz, blues, funk, indie, reggae and world music, with an emphasis on original content. While we host many well-established artists, including the occasional international touring artist, we also prioritise the support and nurture of emerging talent. Butcher's Brew is a well-run, intimate and, ex and inclusive venue with excellent acoustics and sight lines, disabled access, clean facilities and a premium drinks list that showcases many excellent products from local craft breweries and distillers. I'm proud of the colour and life we have brought to our community, as well as the playing opportunities we've given thousands of artists since opening in 2018. Prior to opening, I invested over $200,000 of my own money to create a space that is a great room to play, as well as to see and hear great live music. We treat all our artists well, with musicians receiving 100% of ticket sales and being paid quickly and in full, sometimes personally topped up by me if it's been a quiet night. When Sydney went into lockdown in March, Butcher's Brew was the first venue to set up a professional live streaming program to adapt, sorry, to adapt, and we established a safe new revenue model for musicians, production crews and ticketing agencies, all hit by the pandemic. Our live stream for lockdown series had six key aims. One, to keep music lovers in the habit of paying for live music. Two, to promote the mental well-being of musicians who had just lost all their work for the foreseeable future by keeping, them self, by, pe by keeping them safely connected with each other as well as with their audiences. Three, provide artists with high quality recordings of their performances that they could then use to promote their work and secure other gigs. Four, keep high caliber Australian live music accessible to local, regional, national and international audiences. Five, retain a live music infrastructure for post-COVID. And six, keep a little cash flow and optimism percolating through the industry. And we achieved all of these aims. Pre-COVID, we presented eight or more events a week across seven days with a 50 patron capacity. We, we reopened to the public in early June and currently present five gigs a week, Thursday to Sunday, with two events on Saturdays. As well as our reduced opening hours, we have the double whammy of our maximum capacity being reduced by 60% in line with current public health orders to around 20 patrons. So from a potential maximum capacity of 400 or more patrons passing through our doors each week pre-COVID, we are now down to a potential maximum of about 100 patrons, a drop of 75%. Even 100 under present conditions is an exceptional week, requiring every event to sell out and highly susceptible to events beyond our control. For example, since COVID spiked up again in Victoria in July, we've had several nights with great bands playing to around four people due to public nervousness exacerbated by strong messaging about staying home and avoiding any non-essential activity. While we totally understand and support these public health measures, this has obviously been devastating for us in terms of being able to cover our overheads from bar sales, which is our only source of revenue, given that the musicians retain 100% of the door and we don't have or want poker machines or other gambling facilities on the premises. We have adapted by increasing admission prices from a pre-COVID cost of 10 to $20 per event to our current pricing of between $25 to $60, which now includes the addition of a bar tab based on a one or two drink minimum to help us stay viable and still pay artists properly. Pre-COVID, we could afford to take more chances with unknown artists in the comfort that a quiet night early week could be offset by a raging full house on another night. This is no longer possible. And for us to break even, we currently have to rely on every act we book to not only draw a fairly solid 20 patrons, but for each and every one of those patrons to then spend at least $30 over the bar, which really happens. I run the bar with my son, Frankie. Between the two of us, Frankie and I work around 150 hours a week. Our workload has increased significantly due to our stringent attention to hygiene, plus additional COVID marshalling responsibilities, such as managing the proper sign-in of all patrons and ensuring patrons stay compliant with recently introduced restrictions on dancing and so on. Meanwhile, we've had to let two casuals go, as I simply cannot afford to pay more staff in the current climate. As an ethical business owner, I strongly support fair pay, and I've always paid full award rates, including penalty rates. As well as cleaning and sanitising bar services throughout the night, 
Frankie and I also thoroughly clean the entire bar after closing, and we rarely get out before 2 a.m. on trading nights. I'm blessed that my son is so supportive and so willing to work such long hours with me to, to keep the venue running and COVID safe. But despite all our efforts, we have no shot of being sustainable while the current COVID restrictions are in place without the continuation of JobKeeper and other subsidies. JobKeeper has enabled us to stay afloat, along with the $13,000 received in New South Wales Government COVID assistance for small business. Inner West Council has also been generous and supportive, with a $10,000 grant in July for us to install our own professional level in-house live streaming facilities that can kick in immediately if we go back into hard lockdown and also offers potential to develop new, new audiences and revenue streams. This government assistance has been further supplemented by $20,000 pulled from my already modest and shrinking superannuation since May to help me cover my other miscellaneous business and personal costs. I'm also grateful for the moratorium on evictions, which enabled us to negotiate a temporary reduction in rent with a resistant landlord. However, since this moratorium has ended, we are again vulnerable, and this will be another crucial area to address in the immediate term, so that COVID-affected tenants and landlords both have protection and can come to fair agreements on ongoing sustainable rents as we all ride out this crisis. I applaud initiatives such as the New South Wales Great Southern Nights Program and the Federal Live Music Australia Program, both set to reboot the live music sector from November. This is money very well spent, as this type of targeted funding not only helps venues stay afloat in the short and medium term, there is a direct and immediate flow through to artists, production crews, and other subgroups of the sector who have all been devastated by this pandemic. If these or similar cash for gigs awards with straightforward inbuilt guaranteed minimum payments for artists and venues could be expanded into a more regular feature of arts funding, it would go a long way towards saving the sector. I would finish by thanking John Wardle and the team at, Live Music, at the Live Music Office for all their assistance and advocacy over the last few years, as well as more recently, the much appreciated support we have received from the Office of Music New South Wales. Thank you. All right. Um, look, thank you all for that um, um, fairly sobering um, uh, round of evidence. Um, and it adds to what we've heard already today. Uh, we'll have a round of questioning through the committee. And we'll start with John Graham. Right. Thank you, Chair. And thanks for that um, <clears throat> evidence. Um, it is pretty confronting to hear. Um, thanks for everything you're doing for the city. It'd be a very different city without your venues. Um, and I talk to a range of venues in the course of my work, but it's still upsetting every time to hear um, just how tough it is at the moment. Um, we took evidence this morning that um, as it's got tougher, there's a risk here that we might lose 85% of our music venues over the six to nine month window if there's not assistance, if something doesn't give, if there's not a change in the regulations or if there's not uh, some sort of uh, fiscal assistance. Just thinking about your own venue, do you think that is, does that reflect what you're seeing uh, on the ground? And can I say, we know this is tough to say and to talk about, and we acknowledge that. Mark, we might start with you. I think we've been too successful at our request for muting, Mark. <laughs> While Mark's coming online, Sam? Yes, we have an answer to that question. In, in, um, yeah. The answer is yes, it is inevitable. Um, Sorry, yeah. Unfortunately, there are many factors as to why that's the case. Um, and it, it does vary from the different um, representation that you have here today, from something like what Carolyn operates to some of the touring venues that we operate. As I always say, we, we have a huge reliance on borders being open and acts being out of the tour but also the operating costs of the venues, especially as they get larger with the current four square metre rate in place. Those two things together mean that it's just not viable to, to operate and plan. There's a, there's a series of um, steps that happen within a workflow for getting a concert up and running and, and delivered um, from the time of booking the show, marketing the show, um, you know, pre-production for the particulars and then hosting the show on the night. And as the venues get larger, that time span increases. Um, but if you don't have any certainty and you're unable to plan that, it means that further and further time goes along, we are unable to forecast of when we can expect revenues back in because we don't know when touring is going to be back, we don't know at what capacities, etc. 
So the answer is yes, it's inevitable, um, especially with the point that Caroline raised in regards to rent um, and the moratorium on rent. I, I think that is one of the biggest challenges we all will be facing um, in the very, very short months ahead. Um, and um, yeah, so I'll, I might leave, leave it to some of the others to, to contribute here as well. Thanks, Sam. Uh, we'll go Mark, Tyler, and then Carolyn. Mark? I'm loath to go to you, Tyler, because I'm sure Mark can come back on. It's just a bit of a delay in getting the mute button sorted. Thank you. Um, sure, no problem. Look, uh, oh, I have to... Um, sorry? Yeah, you go. Um, yes, I, I concur with um, and, and uh, support everything that Sam has said. Um, if uh, current restrictions continue, um, Oxford Art Factory is facing a very grim future, um, one of possible closure and uh, turning it, uh, becoming, you know, uh, running into a receivership. And uh, if we can't trade as normal, uh, that's that's. That, that, is, that is definitely on the cards. Um, with the current um, restrictions, we can only operate to 17% capacity, uh, which is just not um, workable at the moment. We are running shows, um, and we will be running shows, but effectively we're running them at a, at a, at a loss. Our occupancy um, uh, costs and outgoings are not covered uh, by this. Uh, we're doing it mainly to continue to uh, support the industry, support artists, and uh, keep the industry alive and, and keep it uh, uh, keep the public focused on it, so that uh, we can prepare ourselves best as best we can for when uh, you know restrictions do ease. But uh, as Sam said, it, it's absolutely uh, impossible for us to gauge uh, when that will be or how the future uh, unfolds. Uh, I have bookings confirmed for the end of um, September with very limited uh, capacity. And as Caroline said, I need to, uh, you know, we bank on it being a full capacity of 70 people at two shows, but, um, you know, uh, there's no guarantee that everyone, everyone's going to show up if COVID restrictions and uh, public uh, government announcements are such that people should stay safe. Um, and stay at home. So it's one thing we need to try and get people to, uh, you know, follow through with their commitment to live music. But, you know, on the other hand, we're also very much uh, in line with the government that we want people to be safe, you know. And, um, but, you know, it, it's, it, it's an uncertain future. It's also one that, that I have to, you know, trial and see how these limited shows will pan out. If we end up running desperately more into the red, it may be a case of, um, you know, having to cancel certain shows. But once again, as Caroline said as well, uh, I think the um, Great Solid Nights initiative is a fantastic initiative and we are certainly playing a large role in that and I'm sure other venues are as well. But how it will actually pan out in terms of our fiscal, uh, you know, budgeting and our survival uh, is another thing. You know, it, it will certainly put, uh, you know, the live music industry in the limelight. Uh, but whether it supports the venues uh, from an economic point of view is yet to be seen because we're working with very, very limited uh, capacities. Uh, you know, uh, Mark, did you, say, did you say 17%? Okay. Um, Tyler. Thank you. Um, yeah, to echo, I guess, what Sam and Mark have said as well, even with the hope of restrictions lifting somewhat, uh, we are at these reduced capacities uh, where our revenue is limited. It's also to be considered that patron and nightlife culture has changed through COVID. I think a lot of people are, you know, choosing to stay home for a variety of reasons and their usual drinking and eating habits have changed. So that is what we're seeing with our, our turnover and what percentages we're at, even though we are at these 70 capacity uh, events in our spaces. It's, you know, it is also, we have to consider the 1.5 metres between each table or group, um, which is, you know, looking at the stadiums lifting their uh, capacities and having 
one seat next to uh, one empty seat next to people that's a lot closer than the 1.5 meters so for us if we were to have restrictions from the four meter square rule reduced to two meter square to, as a trial period for instance um, the 1.5 meter distance in a venue setting would also need to be considered um, it is you know as mark said we're booking shows through to the end of this year and into 2021 but some of these events we're rebooking for the fifth and sixth time uh, a lot of the agents or artists are unsure of when capacities will be getting back to our closer uh, regular capacities as that is ticketing is the artist's main one of their main source of income so it is really hard we're doing our best but um, some artists as well are scared to return to live shows. They don't want to be seen as a source of an outbreak uh, or, you know, um, it, it's the cost that they have to put on an event uh, with such minimal income coming from ticket sales. Uh, so, yeah, it's, I think it is inevitable. You will see a lot of venues closing in the next six to nine months if there isn't some sort of support that, the current grants are quite different in um, we have to use those on specific things like our events or operating production and training staff, which is great, uh, but it is more helping our operating costs and debts that have been incurred through our closures and, and this recovery. Hello, Caroline. Yeah, I totally agree with, with everything, all the points that were already made. Um, and I guess for us, it's things like the continuation of JobKeeper. Uh, once that starts getting wound back, that's quite scary for us. Um, and also, um, as, I, as I mentioned, the moratorium on rents is a big thing for us. And as Tyler just mentioned there too, um, if there's any um, possibility of having the social, you know, the social distancing reduced slightly, that would, that would be a big help to us as well. Um, thanks all. Uh, Ms. Kate Fairman. Thanks, Chair, and thank you all for appearing today. And uh, thank you for the work, the hard work that you've uh, put in over many years, some of you, for uh, in terms of contributing to the cultural fabric of our city. Um, and I'm sorry that you're going through what you're going through at the moment. It's um, truly awful. Um, just wanted to get a sense. We've heard, of course, the 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 um, physical distancing, relaxation rules for the stadiums that um, many of you and other witnesses have mentioned and uh, the increase to 50% capacity. Have you had any conversations with um, government agencies about reducing um, uh, the square metre rule to one person every two square metres, for example, or increasing capacity? I just wanted to get a sense, because this is clearly a public accountability committee which is looking at government response and making recommendations to government. Um, how has the engagement been so far? Uh, what engagement has there been around trying to develop a COVID safe, looking at how to reopen your venues COVID safely and asking them if you could, you know, looking at re sort of reducing the per square metre rule, which you're all advocating here today? Uh, look, I might just pick a, 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 an order. We might go Sam, Caroline, Tyler and then Mark. Thanks. Thanks for the question, Kate. No, we haven't had any, personally, since we haven't had any direct consultation or have been reached out by any bodies that represent or us for that consultation. However, we were um, aware of the indications of that potentially happening in New South Wales prior to the second wave in Victoria and the spikes in New South Wales. Um, especially, we decided to um, host shows at the time when um, the, the curb was diminishing in New South Wales and, and prior to the second wave. So it was, um, it was potentially with the attention and the hope that that, that um, two square metre rule would come into place. And we've done models along the way with the hope that two square metres would come in place because that starts to open up the idea of getting close to hopefully something like 50% of capacity for some of the spaces. Um, all, all we, we're nowhere near that at the moment. We're, we're you know, running similar to Mark between 15 and 20. So um, it's, um, it's not saying okay, consultation is a short answer, but it is something that we'd be very interested in looking at. And we've taken measures, and I know um, our peers, we've all been taking additional measures to 
not just what's in the COVID safe plan, to ensure that people do feel safe coming out. It's imperative to us that, that audiences um, feel safe, that they know that we're taking the measures required to keep them safe. We've taken that extremely seriously in the um, uh, policies that we've adopted in our plans, and I know that um, that might be us here today have as well. And, um, uh, you know, I think if that conversation could start, we'd love to be able to be in it, but certainly we would from Century. Um, yeah, for, personally, uh, we haven't had any anybody directly contact us to um, outline what COVID measures we should take. So it's basically been us proactively seeking that information out, implementing that ourselves. Where did you find it, Carolyn? Uh, online, mostly. So, so with the live streaming, I, I um, made sure that was uh, uh, okay to do. Uh, I went through the legislation that was uh, the, the public, you know, surrounding public health orders at uh, beginning of April, and, and saw that live streaming was specifically excluded. Um, and elsewhere, I've gone on to the uh, uh, the New South Wales government site. Uh, was um, is it government New South Wales? Yes, the one yeah. with the little uh, yeah. water. Yeah, so uh, so I just basically keep myself updated that way. Yeah, Sorry. yeah. Thanks, Carolyn. So you've just been a sort of proactive hunt from from link to link on New South Wales. Yes, yes. So I just follow the links and fill in the forms and. Yeah. Tyler. Thank you. Um, yeah, I guess to, to echo again, it, it hasn't really been very clear who we can contact uh, or that we can have input as to these restrictions lifting slightly uh it's the, you know it seems like it is quite a state-wide um restriction that seems very above us in decision making um we again have gone through new south wales health websites which we found initially a bit confusing at the start our first measurements of our venue space was just in standing space for uh patrons which was quite a lot smaller uh, upon second look on the New South Wales site, it, it says the full room capacity wall to wall, uh, which helped us get to the point of realising we could reopen. Uh, but again, at that sort of 15% of our regular capacity. Um, and music, music New South Wales have been a great help uh, to us as well as many other venues in providing information. Uh, but at this stage, there hasn't been any discussion on how we can help with lifting these restrictions or, or on capacities. Mark? Yes, thank you. Um, in, in direct answer to the question from Kate, no, we have, I've not been directly contacted by any government agency in terms of any relaxation that moves it to one per two, uh, two square metres. Um, in, in light of that, though, I'd have to say that um, I kind of feel that I'd probably speak for most of us. The music industry or the live music venues tend to be kind of ignored. Uh, I get most of my information from the AHA or the Surrey Hills Liquor Accord. And uh, online, uh, there's no direct uh, consultation or anything directed directly at us. I feel that we're kind of an anomaly that uh, you know behaves differently and acts differently, and it feels like most of the decision making that is uh, reported or given out is is directed at hotels and pubs and, and clubs. Uh, so, you know, with that in mind, uh, you know, uh, you have to think on your feet and. Uh, yeah, most of everything that I did to plan for the Oxford Art Factory to open uh, back in July it was all gotten from information from, through, um, you know, uh, the AHA and the Surrey Hills Liquor Accord and whatever I could get online and from public announcements as well. There was nothing direct, uh, directly made, uh, uh, no contact was made. Um, in terms of the one per square metre, uh, if we need to take into consideration that we're talking about limited space. When you're talking about live music venues, we're not talking about stadiums. We're talking about small to medium spaces that offer uh, stages for up-and-coming artists and emerging artists and you know, international and national uh, uh, headline acts as well. Um, the social distancing that uh, we need to afford uh, our limited capacity is 1.5 metres. Um, if I move from 1.4 one four square metre to 1.2, it's not going to make much difference to me in terms of having to afford people the 1.5 metre distance between different groups. So we need to 
take into account that, you know, we're dealing with people coming from different areas and people unknown to each other. So we need to respect the fact that um, we want to keep the social distancing at the forefront of all our operations. You know, and Oxford Art Factory from the get-go has implemented COVID-safe house policies and ensured that it was always playing by the rules and, um, you know, you know, implementing the required um, operations into every facet and every aspect of our COVID safe operation. Thanks, Mark. Um, Trevor Khan. Um, uh, good afternoon to you all. Firstly, can I just say to all of you, um, uh, firstly, my deepest sympathy for what you're going through. Um, and the second thing is, I think for all the witnesses, including yourself, I've been uh, overwhelmingly impressed um, at your attitude to accepting that this is a public health problem that that um, that can't be avoided. Um, so I'm 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 grateful. I, the the hearing has developed in in a quite a different way than perhaps I was expecting. So I'm grateful to you. It makes it a lot easier. I, I suppose, um, and it partly picks up on what Mark just said. Um, one of my concerns is we can call call it the Tattersall's Club problem, uh, and that is where you have, uh, well, I'll call them patrons, they obviously weren't in that context, but patrons from uh, a very diverse area over Sydney, and I know, Mark, in terms of your club, because it's just up the road from my unit, uh, you do get them from everywhere. Um, I, I suppose my concern is, is that if a uh, an outbreak occurs in any of your your establishments with people drawn over all Sydney. That's probably our most um, uh, the, our, our worst nightmare of occurring. Um, and I'm, I, I absolutely accept that none of you want that. So I'm wondering if if we're looking at the uh, which I think will come out of this committee, I think is is some invitation for the government to look at the four square, two square metre uh, uh, restriction. I wonder if you have any other suggestions as to how we can uh, avoid uh, the uncontrollable spread in the unfortunate event that uh, that one of your places is hit. Is there some other area of restriction or supervision that you think might be capable of implementation that, that might counterbalance the risks that we're all talking about? All right. Um, who wants to have first go at this? Sam, I see you moving forward to the microphone. Sam. <laughs> 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 and um, and uh, our approach is following the health advice, and I think that it is difficult to ask venue music operators, you know, music venue operators, to come up with health advice on how to do that. That's fair. Um, yeah. Of course, we can we, we can follow the measures. We're a very agile group of industries, like a group of people and venues um, have, especially ones in New South Wales that have. Um, seen through some difficult regulatory time in the past five to ten years, and it's great to see some of those things being addressed in the recent announcements. However, um, you know, we've been focusing on following all of the health advice and the measures we've been taking. Some of the things that we have been doing that have been interestingly, I think, helpful is that we have been sanitising the venue with fogging after the shows. We have been using alternative exits to people coming into the venue um, so the, the audiences, if we were to run more than one session, do not overlap. We are cleaning rigorously in, in terms of all of the surfaces. Um, but um, in regards to additional measures beyond that, um, it's difficult for us to say, well, that will mitigate against spreading. What I can say, however, is that we have the best opportunity to control patronage when they come in. Unlike a public club, People don't just come in and sit somewhere. We have access control. They come in in an orderly way in which we identify them at entry um, through multiple projects. So we were um, temperature checking every single patient when they came in. They also registered through um, the QR codes and we're scanning their details and have all their details in advance. So one of the things that was very successful with us when we started was communication with patients yeah. um, in advance via text message, email, about all of the um, expectations we had of them as a live music audience and were very pleasantly surprised to see them adhered to. 
We also did a survey with patrons that came that um, gave us a very high rating, 99% gave us five star ratings that they felt safe because of measures that we were taking, like our patrons, our staff wearing masks and those other measures that I mentioned. So I think there are a series of best practice things we can do that may not apply to every single venue footprint, but could apply to um, some rather than others, um, or in most circumstances, some of those things I've mentioned certainly help. But I think from a contact tracing and control perspective, it's somewhat easier because people are coming in for a specific period of time and then leaving. They're not coming and going. We're not having audiences um, share share spaces when they are seated at the moment. So it's very controlled. Um, we, we allocated everyone to their spot. We knew where they were. It was very... Um, it, it was very easy from that perspective to control the social media, media, media but we needed a lot of resources to do it. So the caveat to all that, yeah, we could do it, but we needed the sort of resources to, to do that that would be required to run somewhere like the Enmore Theatre that we were doing at the Factory Theatre. So there, there, there's, you know, there's a myriad of problems with that, but I think that the main thing is, is if you look at what other places are doing, stadiums, pubs, clubs, we are very, very equipped to control um, the contact tracing element of it and also where patrons go once they're in because they're there to see a performance. They're not there to mingle, go to this table, go to that table, etc. So from that perspective, I think we're actually probably best placed to be able to mitigate against those risks. Well, I think uh, David's going to allow me to intervene before the others are... are, are, are asked but but let me let me just make the observation and Sam you're probably speaking to the converted uh, in a sense but if I go into a restaurant which I will frequently do uh, the quality of the recording of the patron uh, uh, details uh, is variable at best um, uh, uh, indeed I am certain that in some of the places that I visit I including Mark yeah, principally in the Darlinghurst area, some of the details recorded are either uh, very limited or actually false. Uh, so I, it's actually in that contact tracing area where I wonder what the best practice is and what you think in terms of either requiring some additional form of identification or the like to ensure that if something goes wrong, it can be traced very, very quickly. That's where I, my thinking no, no. is going. So, so what I might do is I might go to uh, Tyler and Caroline and Mark and then come back to you, Sam, if you've got something to add. Tyler? Um, yeah, I, I guess we are following health advice as well and a, a lot from New South Wales Health and the COVID, uh, uh, COVID safe policies that we've created in our venue, uh, which it, it can be quite unclear. There was one thing on New South Wales Health site uh, which stated... The, the four metre square rule uh, with 1.5 metres between groups or people where possible. Uh, what does that where possible mean? I think having a, a set of regulations for venues uh, that do help more venues do the right thing. Um, you know, it is, we can say we're doing everything we can and appropriately, but the pub down the road may not be. And we are noticing that, especially in the inner West, I've seen a lot of venues, uh, pubs more so, uh, getting fined for not following the regulations. Um, so it is, we can put our own um, procedures in place, uh, communicating with patrons, as Sam has said, um, encouraging table orders and things like that. Uh, but it is, uh, I do think that it is maybe above what we are able to do ourselves in creating a better guideline that all venues should be able to follow. Um, Caroline, I'll just say from my own experience, I run a bushwalking club and I've, I've used this opportunity to get a QR code for the bushwalking club. It's made sign on much easier and it also gives our health and um, indemnity statements much easier. Caroline. Yeah, I'd um, uh, uh, echo what Mark was saying. Um, I think the way that our model has changed now is that um, 
before people just used to, we didn't used to use that much uh, pre-booking and now every, every event is pre-booked. So essentially we have a, a, a pre-existing list of people who have booked for tickets through the, through the sticky tickets. Um, and then we also have people registering their QR code as they arrive at the venue. Um, and um, on top of that, uh, as far as the hygiene measures go, um, an additional measure that we do that isn't necessarily required, but we do it anyway, is that we double wash everything now, or double wash all our glasses, double wash all, all our cutlery and, and so on. Thanks, Colin. Mark? Mark? <clears throat> We might come back to Mark in a sec. Yes, thank you. Oh, yeah. um, I just wanted to uh, concur and, and, and support all the comments that have been made previous. Um, in, in answer to the, the question, um, the, the thing that the live music uh, has always presented is, is that there are many, many steps that, are, that, have, that have to be taken, that have to be crossed off. Uh, T's have to be crossed, I's have to be dotted in order for a live music performance to go ahead. This is even before COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So during COVID-19, it's even more stringent and, and we are an industry that takes on board everything that the government tells us and we execute it to the nth degree. So in answer to the contact tracing, we've been implementing contact tracing since day one when it needed to be. But not only that, our ticketing vendor does the same thing as well. At the front door, we measure people's temperature. We take their identities, etc. And as Sam said previously as well, we're, we're actually a, an industry that's focused on the stage. It's not, it's not a matter of moving around. You couldn't have a better industry to actually show the way forward in terms of safety. I feel safer going to a music venue than I would anywhere else. That's not taking away anything from anybody else, but I'm just suggesting that this is this is why we're here today. We, we're asking you to save us so that we can help you save others. You know, it's, it's um, imperative that live music is there when we're working through this pandemic, when we're working through this recovery. We are the people that know how to operate groups of people. We know how to operate large groups of people. We know how to operate small and crowd control small uh, lots of people. You know, so we're, the, you know, we're, we're operating on a loss with a 17% capacity. Um, it shows how, you know, a diligent and how uh, versatile we are in adapting to change. You know, so in answer to the question, um, I think there's many things that can be learned from the, the way that live music is adapting itself to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, it's, it's David Chirich here, the chair. The, um, it, it seems to me that there is a very, there's a very distinct set of issues in relation to live music and theatre venues, uh, purely live music and theatre venues. And there, there seems to just be some obvious benefit in um, a representative group of, of, of venues together with your representative bodies, and that might be Music New South Wales and or the Live Music Office, getting together urgently with Create New South Wales and New South Wales Health and working through these issues very, very urgently. Because the best way of saving you all seems to be getting you back safely to the largest possible audience you can safely accommodate. Do, do you think that concept of an urgent round table uh, with that as your goal, is something you'd support? Sounds great to me, yeah. Caroline? Sam? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd like to say yes. We're, and I've, we are already contributing to a live dashboard, a get ready dashboard for the country with the Australian Live Music Business Council. Um, we are in our organisation. And um, we have already begun um, with the support of Music New South Wales to collectively discuss these issues as venues for the first, first time collectively, there's more than 60 of us that have come together. And we do have a list of priorities to help us get out of this. Um, but it isn't just about stimulus and, rec and, and a handout, but it, it, it's needed. There is a recovery, there is a, a survival part of this that we need to look to. And Victoria did it early on, mm. and we're in the exact same position. But absolutely, there are um, uh, a sharing of knowledge in that way. I've got to just go back to your other point, David. Too. We collect all of that data in advance 
and we've been doing that for a very long time. The relationship we have with people because they absolutely love coming to our venues is very strong and they do listen to our recommendations. Um, we were providing that prior to COVID, as Mark was saying, in terms of information for the town, but yes, that's, that's shifted as well. But I do, do think that would be valuable data as well Resolved. to have a um, collective round table. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Sam. Tyler? Uh, yes, I agree. And as Sam said, it is something that we have started discussing with um, the help of Music New South Wales. Uh, it is, you know, it, it, there is different components to that, and it's not just uh, helping with lifting restrictions. It is uh, stimulus and support um, in a financial world to help us through the closure period and the recovery period. Oh yeah, and I don't want it to be to be said that we've ignored this slew of evidence we've had today that there is a desperate need for some operating. Um, financial operating assistance before be, be, before the end of the year. That, for me as the chair, I think I've heard that um, in a united way. Uh, Mark? Yes, thank you. Um, look, I, 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 I concur with everything that's been said. It's a bit difficult to hear everyone and, and, and uh, have it in time. But, but look, I just want to repeat what I'm saying before. Um, the live music industry is about others. It's not about us. Live music is something that presents something to others. It, it, it benefits others. Uh, it's been proven that children exposed to the music are going to be better off than if they weren't exposed to it. So look, this is about the future. It's not about it's safeguarding businesses as such. But it is, it is and it's a, when you're talking about immediate assistance, but what I'm talking about is actually the future. If we lose us, we're gone for good. And if you lose us, you're gonna lose the culture of Sydney and you're potentially gonna lose a massive slice of the economy as well. This is about utilizing an industry that is run um, uh, on the, the, the passion of what people bring to it, but with the execution that is equivalent to sending somebody to the moon. You know, we need to take this on board, and I totally concur with what David Schubert just said. It's important that the live music industry be taken in and spoken to and asked for advice. We can offer advice. We're here to help. Um, uh, Natalie Ward, uh, you had some questions? Thank you, Mr Chair, in the four minutes that I think are left. Thank you all very much um, for coming along and assisting the committee, and uh, can I echo my colleagues, we the... Um, really feel for uh, the industry and um, I think you can see we're all here to try and help. So um, thank you for everything you're doing. Uh, I just wanted to ask about that issue of input um, and um, just sort of explore that in the brief time that's left. Uh, obviously the Great Southern Nights is a great initiative and some of you have commented on that. Uh, but I just want to understand the sort of avenues for input that you're having to government, and particularly to New South Wales, well, probably you can't have every single individual group. <laughs> um, there has to be industry body. So are you communicating with Music New South Wales? Is that effective? Are they conveying um, to go? I understand they're having discussions, but is that a useful mechanism? And is, have you had the opportunity to put things forward to Music New South Wales? Who wants to try that? Caroline, why don't we yes, start with you? Um, so, so Music New South Wales have contacted me directly. They've been very proactive with that. Uh, and I've also had uh, uh, a long-standing um, you know, advice and advocacy from um, uh, the live music office as well. So if I, if, if I do have any questions, I'll quite often call them and just sort of say, can I do this or should I do that or how should I do this? So, so they've also been very helpful. So we're, we're, you know, we're talking about yes. setting up yet another type, which is probably good too, but with the existing ones that work is ongoing, have you had the opportunity to... What those yes. suggestions for, to well, well, Music New South Wales have contacted me in the last week, and I'm not sure about the, the, the relationship with other people here, but um, yes, so so with that, that is a developing relationship there. Um, since you came in the last week, did yes, you? Yes, in the last week or two, yeah, yeah. Sam. And the others? Yes, yes, we've been we've been in contact with Music New South Wales um, as well, and they've been supportive in um, helping us uh, put together some objectives to, to move forward and, and connect with them in the main way. We really, we really, a lot of these businesses stand alone, and as I mentioned in my earlier address, uh, kind of kind of overlooked, and that's okay because they're commercial businesses. But this situation 
is dire because we often, most of us rely on about 70% of our capacities to break even because the lion's share of ticketing monies go back to artists, pay, and the associated industries. So that's, you know, agents, managers, production yeah. crew, tour managers, and the like. So it's, 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 um, it's important that we're coming together now. Um, connecting through Music New South Wales has been effective. Uh, it's just, we do need, need to move very quickly. Um, and, um, and that's something that um, we were keen to address today, just put forward but as well, that there's definitely a need um, for a similar package like in Victoria. And um, we're putting together a body to prevent that forward. It's just, and, and whether that comes through Music New South Wales or through another, another mechanism, we, we, we'll see that we are talking with them and they've been really helpful in connecting and supporting um, what the needs are. Because if we're not here, there is no, there is no platform for artists. So they're, 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 um, their broader quota um, supports what, what, we're, what we're looking at here. So, yeah. Tyler and then Mark. Yeah, I agree. Music New South Wales has been great in helping us come together as a body of venues, um, which it is, uh, you know, as, as Sam mentioned, we do kind of survive on our own and, and reach out for support throughout the music industry when we need to. Um, but Music New South Wales has been really great and we've had meetings, uh, lots of Zooms together, uh, where we have been able to discuss our hardships with landlords and insurance and um revenue in general, uh, the grants as well, and, and helping assist us with that. So, yeah, it, it is really great having a body like them to help um, pull our ideas together and uh, have a bit of a voice, I think. Mark? Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, look, my, my, our relationship with music, uh, New South Wales obviously goes back some years uh, during the, uh, the, the dark years of the lockout laws. Um, so, yeah, I've had a long-standing relationship with uh, Music New South Wales and the live music office, and they've both been ex extremely supportive and helpful um, in uh, steering uh, Oxnard Fentry and helping us um, uh, navigate uh, a lot of regulatory uh, changes that have come our way. And, um, yes, Music New South Wales has certainly been very helpful during the COVID pandemic, and we look forward to working with them uh, on, uh, ongoing. And uh, without them, uh, I certainly would be in a, a different place, I think. Yeah, yeah before the... You should me. Um, I just want to ask if they're feeding back to you the process that they're actually taking that forward to the events department. and that's actually um, suggestions are not just being you know parked that they're going forward in the process. Are they feeding that process back to you about the events task force. Um, sorry, Natalie. Before I put that question to the witnesses, but the reason that the secretary had been mute is there's a lot of feedback and squeaking when when you're not muted in while we're getting the answers. Yeah, sorry. Yep. Yeah, I'll just mute it. So, so, so the, the, the question is, um, has there been feedback from Music New South Wales to different venues about the, the work that's happening at the task force? Have you had that feedback? Caroline? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I do get a lot of emails, which I, which I don't always get a chance to eat doing, due to my work yeah, hours. No, I just join the <laughs> club. Join the club, Caroline. <laughs> <laughs> but but I've, I've certainly become a, a lot more aware of uh, music New South Wales in the last in the last couple of weeks. Yeah. Um, Tyler, Sam, Mark. Um, yes, we're, we're aware of the, I guess, task force that Music New South Wales have helped bring together within the venues and uh, what we're putting together to want to present. So, um, but it's, I guess, work in progress, as uh, Sam suggested, it is something that we do need to hurry along. Uh, it is time consuming as we're all busy running our own venues and keeping our heads afloat. Uh, but yeah. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, Thank Sam, you. Sam and then Mark. Yes, we're certainly uh, aware of some of the more, more so in terms of um, what our priorities need to be as part of that, less so in regard to other um, parts of the industry that she is, you know, the organisation needs to represent because we've needed to form formulate that together. So, yeah, we, um, we've been sharing and working with with Music New South Wales to um, get them to understand what our needs are and also be able mm. to present that forward. So, yeah. Mark? Yeah, that's right. Thank you.
All right. Um, Mark normally waits till I make an, an awkward intervention and then he comes off mute. Mark? Yeah, just quickly. Yeah, no, I just, <laughs> I just wanted to concur with everything that's been said in support. Um, All right. Yeah, sorry. Uh, just, uh, Thanks. Can I speak? Yeah, please, go ahead. Oh, sorry, yeah, look, I just wanted to, uh, yeah, support everything that's been said about Music New South Wales. They've certainly um, upped the ante and, um, you know, they realise, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the distress that we're all in and they've been extremely supportive and um, uh, vigilant in um, bringing uh, people together uh, to find solutions and work through them and uh, come up with solutions and, uh, you know, the, the ones that we've been talking about today, you know, and, and um, let's hope that we can bring something to the table for the government that uh, will see us through this recovery and uh, that we can lead the way for uh, the people of Sydney and New South Wales. All right. Um, thank you. They say one of the great benefits of a task force is it makes your committee feel much more, um, much more impressive if you call it a task force. Um, <laughs> Uh, the, um, um, but look, can I say um, there's been some quiet discussion between some of the members while this has been happening. There's still some fairly loud discussion going behind me at the moment, actually, between members. Um, but one of the things we have um, one of the things we have discussed is I think we've all agreed on a resolution that today's transcript we will try and get it urgently from Hansard and provide it to create new. Hansard's nodding. We'll try and get it urgently from Hansard and provide it to create New South Wales with an endorsement from the committee as to the urgency of the matters Possibly today. Other agencies. Yes, and, I think and, so. And, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah amongst, amongst other agencies. So, look, thank you all for the work you do. Um, thank you for um, um, keeping culture, keeping the pulse of culture alive in our cities and towns and regions. Um, and, um, and I think your evidence has been compelling. And, and I'm sorry we have to go on to the next session. In the coming weeks Thank and months, you I'll come much. and try and visit. Thank you. <laughs> I